says we're going to patrol the police, we have a legal right to do so. So by the time we were able to patrol the police, everybody is trained, the first 14 people, it took us two months to get 14 people with one sister there. Mr. Ioki gave us three or four more guns. I bought four or five of them. And, you know, with my paycheck, I had a good paycheck from the city government at the time. And I'm just saying, we went out, got my old car, and we got his father's car. And, uh, and there we were with walkie-talkies, law books, tape recorders, the law books, tape recorders, and everybody had a gun, a legal gun. As long as the weapon was not concealed, it was not illegal. You didn't have a lie around the chamber of a rifle shotgun until you got out of the car. And so on. You couldn't point a weapon at somebody, even casually. If it had a lie around the chamber was a rifle or a handgun, under California law, it constituted assault with a dead weapon. So everybody was taught this fact. We said, when we go patrol, only one person talk, and never interrupt the police officers doing something, let him first speak to you. We have Supreme Court rulings and precedent to show that once a police officer says something to you, then they cannot necessarily charge you with interfering with a police officer carrying out his duty. So this was all down in law. We knew this. Everybody knew it. They knew the 10 point program. They'd been in the political education class, etc. So you have to imagine that night when we got out of the car, I walk and talk, and I say, Huey, Huey, Huey. I said, took a block and a half up the street. You see the police? He says, yeah. I said, let's pull over. He said, let's pull over and park legally. In that movie, Panther, by Melvin Van Peebles, he's got our car and our wheels all on the curb. That's what we did. We were as legal as you can get. Because Huey's point was, one person talk, if the police say. I would rather have 14 people in the courtroom, as Huey would say, testify to the same exact thing than to have a whole, he said, she said, he did, they did. We don't want that. That is not our method. We go organize. We have to be clean and sharp. And I told everybody, I said, now everybody, you got an iron shirt, blue shirts. I said, your blue shirts, your sisters, the blue blouse or whatever, because those are our colors, black and blue. We got that from some blues, too. What did I do to be so black and blue? <laughs> the symbolic of the oppression that black folks had suffered under. This is what we got there from our colors with black and blue, with the black and red. And I says, I want my pants iron. What? I said, I want to make, I take a shower. <laughs> Before you go back, well, I already took one this morning, so when you go back, take another to see. Damn, tell me what we got to do that. I said, because you're not blibbies. No, what the hell is a blippy? I say a black hippie who won't take a bath. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jim, I said, you go down to the black community, the poor lawyer community, people trying to struggle to get out of poverty, and you come down there stinking. It's one of them old black folks, you come in there, we're going to organize you. Black folks say, boy, you better go organize some soap under your ass. <laughs> My point is, we had to be clean, organized, and ready. And when we walked up that night, standing out there that night, that cop didn't even see us because he was sitting in his open passenger door. His arrestee had his hand on the back of the trunk. Must have been a traffic ticket, but his door was open to police officer. He was doing something on the radio. And we walked up, and we were really getting from him. He's out in the street because this is one, two, three lanes on the curb. There's a wide street, 7th Street, but it's a red light district in the black community. There's 40 or 50 people on the street there, some have stopped. But as we walked up, most of them stopped. 40, 14 of us are 40 feet or so. And we're just off the curb. And so somebody walked out of the store, it's dark. What they all lined up out there with them sticks in their hands. I said, man, they made no sticks, them goddamn gun. Guns, I'm getting out of here. And so Huey says, no one leave. Huey was at this end, I was standing next to Huey and everybody else was he said, everyone stay here. We have a new black, new organization, a black Panther party. And he was pointing at the cop. I'm looking at and, and as the cop is getting out of the car, he says, we need to watch these racist police and observe them who've been brutalizing our people in the community, and we know the law. And as Huey turns around, the cop says, you have no right to observe me. He says, no, no, no. Such and such and such. California State Supreme Court ruling states that every citizen has a right to stand and observe a police officer carrying out their duty as long as they stand a reasonable distance away. A reasonable distance in that particular room constitutes 8 to 10 feet. I'm standing approximately 20 feet from you and observe you with the law. Make this 
disconnection, brothers and sisters. We were using the law. And you would wrap that off. We'll observe you whether you like it or not. And some sister in the audience, she said, well, go ahead on and tell it, brother. <laughs> you used to say, we're going to cast the imagination of the people. That's what you did. Cop says, that gun loaded. You say, if I know it's loaded, it's good enough. Well, I have right here that says, step back. You have no right whatsoever, blah, 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 blah. He recited some Supreme Court ruling, blah, 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 versus so and so and so and so and so, which dealt with the right. You cannot remove a person's property from it without due process of law. So step back. You cannot touch my weapon. It is my private property. And some brother in the audience in the was said, man, what kind of Negroes is these? <laughs> I've never heard of I've never seen it before. Organized. Well, is that gun loaded? He was just clack, clack. Well, like I said, if I know it's loaded, that's good enough. Well, when you eject that round in the chamber, clack, clack. The other guys with long guns, about seven of them, clack, 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 clack. That shook, shook up everybody, the audience on the sidewalk started moving back to home. <laughs> Police officer, he's a young, I mean, a middle age, I guess, 40s. He wasn't scared, he was pissed. Because when he looked around and realized it was a whole organized group, we all got black berets. If you didn't have a leather jacket, you had a bush jacket. I remember the sister, she had a bush jacket on. She had these big long earrings. She had this black beret and this big bush. And she had this big 44 <laughs> pistol in a holster that Richard Aoki had given to her. She tied it down, you know. And uh, I, clack, 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 clack. That jacket around, and the police got his arrestee, put him in the car, shut his doors, and he was walking around the back of his car, and he stopped and just walked to make sure this one female was a female. Got in his car and drove off. <laughs> Talking about captured the imagination of people. Some of the, well, at that point, I said, ladies and gentlemen, with the Black Panther Party, my name is Bobby Seale. I'm the chairman of the Black Panther Party. Hugh P. Newton here is the minister of the Prince of the Black Panther Party. And, you know, we're going to organize political electoral power, blah, 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 blah. Some little kid come running around the corner with nine or ten little other kids. See, look, I told you. To my captain imagination of the people. I mean, this stuff got so good with us observing police with legal guns that you have where well, was San Francisco? Now y'all down police, you get that in the pool, we're gonna get the goddamn black pants over here on there. <laughs> I mean, they were threatening the police with us. Now remember, we are a ragtag organization. <laughs> but I'm just saying, that's what happened. We not only captured the imagination of the African American community, we captured the imagination of everybody, including the police themselves, because we was as legal as you could get. We patrolled police for over six months. So they made a law saying that no one could carry a loaded weapon inside city limits. They didn't bother with outside city limits because that dealt with hunters' rights inside city limits. And if you carry a loaded weapon, you cannot carry a loaded weapon within 150 feet of public property inside city limits. And public property included all roadways and byways. Meaning if you're on a public sidewalk, I would have to be 150 feet before I could put a live round in the chamber which is what constituted a loaded weapon under California law at the time. So we stopped patrolling police. But by this time, we got international notoriety anyway. And I led a delegation to the California State Legislature, the armed delegation, 24 males and six females, May 2nd, 1967. And that gave us international notoriety. We was on the front pages of newspapers all around the world. <laughs> 